human beings have changed over the millennium. You know, if you talk to anthropologists, you see there was lots of things that were going on a long time ago, but around 100,000 years ago, humans as we think of ourselves uh, appeared on the planet. There was a little uh, crossover. There was some Neanderthal and other creatures, but essentially we've been hanging around for about 100,000 years in this form. And one thing that has not changed uh, significantly in the last 100,000 years is the human brain. The size of the human brain has remained relatively constant over the past 100,000 years. If we go back farther, you know, we used to be smaller, we got bigger, brain was small, brain got bigger. For about the last 100,000 years, according to anthropologists, we have had relative stability. If we go back 100,000 years and look at the environment in which uh, humans evolved, we find that it was not the same environment that we live in today. In fact, it was a very harsh existence. They say the vast majority of humans ever born on the planet never lived to reproduce. They didn't live long enough to reproduce, which means those people never passed on their genes or their DNA. The only ones that managed to pass on their DNA were the ones that survived, the ones that fulfilled the biological potential of life, that is to get enough to eat, avoid being eaten long enough to reproduce. But we did uh, obviously survive. There were times where it was pretty precarious. They say that 70,000 years ago, after a uh, supervolcano in Indonesia erupted, the climatic changes that occurred were so severe that there were less than 10,000 humans thought to have survived on the planet. That's a level that would be associated with uh, potential extinction. But we didn't uh, completely bite the dust, obviously, we're still here. Uh, and we did manage to survive because we had certain characteristics that favored our survival in the environment. One was that humans were clearly innovators. Uh, our ancestors have used tools in a sophisticated way for at least a million years. We've used fire to process our foods, to provide heat, light, and protection for at least half a million years. Now that means that we've been cooking food for longer than we've been humans in this form. And perhaps the most powerful tool that the planet's ever seen showed up around 100,000 years ago. And that was a tool that allowed us to accumulate an information and pass it on in a geometric fashion, that being, of course, language. And the sophisticated use of language turned out to be a very powerful tool because it allowed us to take information that might have been accumulated over a lifetime of trial and error and pass it on in a few minutes by listening to people speak. But despite these tremendous innovations, the use of tools and fire and language, our population uh, did not thrive. There, during all this time, from about a million years to um, 100,000 years ago, anthropologists tell us there's around 100,000 creatures on the planet, 50 to 100,000 creatures. So we survived, but it wasn't until humans made the connection between the seed and the plant that we really began to thrive. And so this advent of agriculture began to change everything around 10 or 12,000 years ago, relatively recently, biologically speaking. Because now humans were able to transform themselves from nomadic creatures that wandered around hunting and gathering and struggling to survive to being able to settle down in one place. And amongst other changes that allowed uh, for the diversification of labor. Not everybody had to be a subsistence farmer. Uh, it allowed us to take advantage of our innovative potentials. I got a chance to take this picture in Bhutan uh, a few years ago, this is a country where I believe 93% of people are still subsistence farmers. You can see people hand harvesting uh, rice. <clears throat> this is the Bhutanese red rice that many of us enjoy. And hand planting rice, very difficult work. So about 600 years ago, the next big human innovation came along and that was the printing press because now we were able to quantify the products of language and pass it on efficiently. But there was a problem. 
600 years ago, just because somebody wrote something down didn't make it true any more than it does today. So we had a problem. We had all this language and all this talk, and we had now had all this stuff written down, but we needed a way to tell the difference between what was real and what was not. The difference between fact and fantasy, a way to overcome human tendencies to do what are, make what are called errors of attribution, to misattribute cause and effect. And so we essentially invent, invented a system, a mathematically based system, to help us do that. And that system is called science. And science, as we know it, has been around for about 400 years. Now, the scientific method is not perfect, doesn't answer every question, but it does a really good job of answering certain types of questions, and we've become quite dependent on science to help guide us forward. And it was about 200 years ago that the next big innovation came along, and that, of course, was the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution allowed us to change the face of the planet, and amongst other things, it also changed the nature of the food that we eat. Because although we used to raise food and eat food, we have gone now to processing food. And most of the calories that are consumed by most of the people in industrialized countries come through something that looks like this. This is a chart that shows population of humans on one axis against time in billions of years on the other. And you notice that all throughout our early evolution where we have uh, tools and fire and language, population remains relatively constant. By the time of agriculture, population begins to climb. By the time of Jesus Christ, you have 250 million humans on the planet. Today, 7 billion and counting. Now, if you applied this curve to an insect population, it's known as an infestation curve. <laughs> okay, this is you and your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents. And I want you to realize that if any one of these individuals had bit the dust and not lived to reproduce, you wouldn't be here. Back for a thousand generations. If just one of your ancestors hadn't made it. You are the end result, the piece de resistance, the final product of a long chain of successful reproduction. And what's driven this largely is a large bulbous neuronal net located at the end of the spinal column in the human that we refer to as the brain. Our brains, remember, evolved in an environment of scarcity. So for the vast majority of the history, we lived in an environment of scarcity, where the biological imperative was get enough to eat, avoid being eaten, and live long enough to reproduce so you can pass on the DNA that drives all that. If you look at a representation here of a modern human brain, and you look at, it a, at a human brain from 100,000 years ago, what do you notice? Well, they're exactly the same. Uh, anthropologists tell us that there's been really no change uh, in the size and presumably the function of the brain, at least in the last 100,000 years. Now that has some significant implications, because remember, 100,000 years ago, the world looked very different than it does today. Presumably, if you could take a child from today and transport it back 100,000 years, it would be raised by that family and they would not be able to discern the difference. Conversely, if you took a child from 100,000 years ago and could somehow magically transport it today and you were to raise it, you would not be able to tell the difference. They would be just as annoying as children. They would be, develop just as many bad habits as teenagers. They would be essentially the same because the brain that drives the body has not changed. But the brain was designed for this environment, not this environment. And the implications are profound. We've changed the environment, but we still have essentially the same brain. <laughs> the way the brain directs the body is through, largely through chemical interactions. 
There's one particular chemical, this one, I'm sure you all recognize it, <laughs> dopamine, which is C8H11NO2. And this chemical is particularly important because it's associated with an experience you know as pleasure. The more dopamine the brain squirts out, the better you like whatever it is. There are two behaviors that humans have to engage in in order to live and reproduce. One of them is food, right? You've got to eat. And the other one is sex. You have to have sex in order for the genes to be passed on and the cycle to begin again. Food and sex, food and sex, food and sex. Turns out food and sex are the only natural stimulants of dopamine production, unless you're a male human. Yeah, then it's sex and food. But <laughs> whether it's food and sex or sex and food, these are the natural, normal stimulants of dopamine production. And you can imagine why. What if feeding behavior was not rewarded? Do you think people would remember to shop and shop and climb to the tree and go through all those convolutions? Maybe not. And what if sex was not rewarded? You think people would do all that sweating and huffing and puffing if there wasn't some kind of positive feedback? I don't think so. So it made sense, and it's obviously worked by rewarding behaviors that favor survival and reproduction in a natural setting. The brain has been able to direct the body to engage in behaviors that have resulted in our species, and by the way, all the other species we share the planet with survival. This mechanism isn't just in humans. However, <clears throat> it turns out that humans being the great innovators that we are, happened to discover that there were certain chemicals that artificially stimulated dopamine production in the brain, just like natural production from food and sex does. This is one of those chemicals, alcohol. People like alcohol because the way that it makes them feel, because it artificially stimulates dopamine production in the brain. But there's a problem. When you artificially stimulate dopamine production, it can lead to physiological addiction. You can become literally addicted to the point where now you're not only drinking to feel good, you have to keep drinking to avoid feeling bad, which is a hallmark of addiction. And it turns out it's not just alcohol. Humans have spent inordinate amounts of effort finding each and every chemical that just so happens to stimulate that uh, dopamine cascade in the brain. And there are other substances that act on these dopamine cascades as well. There's materials you can take, materials you can inject. There's stuff like this. You know what this is? No, it's not cheese. <laughs> That's casomorphine. That's a whole different uh, thing. This is cocaine. Yeah, cocaine turns out to be a fabulous artificial stimulant of dopamine in the brain. Uh, so much so that, for example, if you were to, can not that we would do this, but if somebody were to canalize the rats of a brain and give them access to cocaine when the little light went on, those rats will continue to press the little button until they're dead. They won't stop to have sex or eat or anything else. They'll just keep pushing that little light in, until they're dead. In fact, if you quantify what happens in the brains of people that uh, smoke cocaine, uh, you find out that uh, if you compare how much dopamine is squirted out when you have an orgasm during sex versus smoking cocaine, there's 10 times more dopamine secre secreted having uh, smoking cocaine than having an orgasm. I was speaking one time, different part of LA, and an uh, older woman, late 70s, early 80s, white hair stood up and she said, excuse me, Dr. Goldhammer, where do you get cocaine? <laughs> That's not the point. <laughs> What's this? Crystal meth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Somebody's born in the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> LSD, PCP, ecstasy. Yeah. None of you know this. Marijuana. And of course, heroin, yeah. So we've, we found all kinds of ways of artificially stimulating dopamine in the brain. And you know, if this was the end of the story, we'd say, okay, drugs are bad, just say no, and that would be the end of it. It's not quite the end of the story though, because it turns out there are certain chemicals that can be added to the feed supply 
that will result in very predictable behavior because these chemicals artificially stimulate the dopamine uh, in the brains of anyone that consumes them. For example, if uh, we put these chemicals, say you take rats and you give them ad libitum chow, in other words, they can eat as much as they want, they'll get to a certain size. But if you put these chemicals in the rat chow, those rats uh, will increase their weight 49% in just 60 days. Uh, they'll, they'll, mice will get huge just by adding these particular chemicals into the, into the chow. Now, if you do it to birds, uh, the birds will get so fat they can't fly. So are the birds and the mice and the rats getting fat for psychological reasons or biological reasons? Are they getting fat because mommy bird didn't love them enough? And daddy bird loved them too much? Or is it biological reasons? Yeah, it's because you artificially stimulate the dopamine cascade in their brains from these chemicals. Now, it turns out, humans, it works the same way. This was not the beginning of ergonomic design. When these stools were designed, people's posteriors were of somewhat different proportion. 